Hari Om and welcome once more and a happy new year to everyone. So we begin the session as we always do with a beautiful invocation presented by uh, Annapurna Murugesh of Standard 12 and Niranjana Biju Kumar of Standard 11, both from Chinma Vidyalaya, Chenganur, who are also part of the KTPI program. So over to the two children. Recorded video. Thank you, thank you, children. That was a very nice uh, the mood has been set. The stage is ready. And we have today our uh, the last session in the class 12 book on other technologies. And we have a very, very special person, uh, the author who has authored the books, the NCRT books that you're all following is one of the authors. Uh, we have uh, Padma Shri, Sri Michelle Damino Nanino here. I'm very, very happy to welcome uh, sir for this wonderful uh, for sparing his valuable time with us today. Uh, very nice to have you, our mixed sir. Uh, brief introduction of uh, Michel G. Uh, he is a French born, uh, but has lived in India since 1977, for almost for the last 45 years, and he's an Indian citizen since 2004. A student of Indian civilization, he has written on uh, proto historical India, on the last river, Saraswati River, and the Indian culture, on India's uh, future uh, 2000, since 2011, and on Sri Arbindo and India's rebirth, an edited volume of 2018. He also co edited with Professor Kapil the two vo volume textbook for the CBSC course, Knowledge, Tradition, and Practices of India. So you have the author here. Shoot all questions that you have, Tim. I'm sure he's the right person to answer your questions. And he has lectured and taught at several educational institutions. Since 2011, he has been teaching courses on Indian civilization and knowledge systems at IIT Gandhinagar where he's currently, currently a visiting professor and assists its Archaeological Sciences Center. Michel G is a member of several scholarly and government bodies, including the Central Advisory Board on Culture, the, run by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, and the National Steering Committee for the Development of National Curriculum Framework and the High Powered Committee of Indian Knowledge Systems, both under the Ministry of Education, Government of India, and uh, in, from, in 2017, Government of India awarded him with Padma Shri for his work on Indian cul culture and education. Let's put our hands together and welcome Sri Meshal Ji for the information of all of you. He has been behind all the sessions we have had till now. Today, it's the eighth session we are having. All sessions he has been suggesting us with the speakers and giving us a lot of uh, support. And uh, the last session, I roped him in. I said, no, you have to show your face now. We want to meet you. And very uh, gladly he admitted and uh, he's available only today. And that's why we are all here. And welcome, Michelle. We are looking forward to having a session with us. I had soft to you and we salute you for all the wonderful work that you're doing for the culture and uh, for our nation. Thank you so much. Over to Michelle G. Thank you, Shantiji, and Namaste, Hari Hom, everyone, especially the children here. And um, I'm to give you a presentation, other technologies, and I had to choice a choice between no slides at all, or maybe 500 slides, uh, which I have actually in, in my laptop. I chose somewhere in between, but, you know, it's not about really imparting all the detailed knowledge. It's more like giving you a little taste of something that you would like to go deeper into. And um, <clears throat> I especially would like to address the children here because uh, the teachers, of course, uh, are equally important and, and are also students. A teacher should be a perpetual student, as we all know. But 
you know, the, many children wonder, you know, why, why should we be exposed to this? How does it help us? And first of all, I'd like to take one minute to address this question. You see, why do, have I felt consistently for the past 30 years that it's important for something of Indian knowledge? Let us say the intellectual, philosophical, scientific, technological, artistic, etc., literary heritage of India. Why is it important? Well, first of all, I'd like to point out that, you know, if you are a, a, a school child in Greece, you're definitely going to learn quite a bit about ancient Greece, ancient Greek. The, the civilization, the history, the accomplishments, uh, the language, uh, sometimes the literature, definitely the mythology and so on and so forth. Because there's so much that, you know, uh, Greeks uh, can be proud of the, the legacy of ancient Greece. Well, why, why should it not be the same situation in India? So this is a question I've often asked. I will not develop this fully, but it has been a kind of aberration in the educational system. And to some extent, NEP is trying to rectify this aberration that students are not naturally exposed to this heritage. And actually, it should be there in all the disciplines. When you learn mathematics, when, you know, the, the contributions of Aryabhatta or Brahmagupta or Bhaskara Shavya come up, they should be naturally integrated. You, would not, you should not need a separate module on history of mathematics. You see, that is the whole point. And uh, similarly, when you, when you study, let us say, geography, water management, which I will briefly show today, should also be present. And when you study maybe biology or life sciences, Something of the Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic approach methods should also be there. So therefore, the paradox is that we are doing, a, and, and I would like to congratulate again and again, Chinmaya and all the institutions and especially the education cell for all this effort, uh, which, which is very necessary because uh, you've been really a leader in this, uh, in, in training uh, teachers, and, and schools and students about this KTPI course. But the paradox is that this course should not be necessary because it should all be there scattered in the, in the you know, curriculum, the syllabus. So this is a distant goal. And in the NEP, we, we're trying to move towards that goal, but at the same time, we will preserve separate modules, even KTPI course, uh, because you know, we need a transition. So the KTPI course is basically its whole philosophy is to provide that transition by giving a wide exposure, but with the hope that eventually all these knowledge, this wealth of knowledge, and please understand that KTPI represents 0.001% of the knowledge that India created and has passed on. All right. So um, I, I have been very, very lucky to meet outstanding scholars. And yet I can say confidently, I have not met a single scholar who is a master of all the disciplines, master of philosophy, as well as language, as well as science, as well as technology, as well as Ayurveda, as well as um, all the arts, performing arts, plastic arts. Uh, it, it is endless. So we have a colossal legacy, and it's our collective duty to preserve it, to assimilate what we can. It will be a small amount. But the beauty is that even if it's a small amount quantitatively, qualitatively, we can absorb the spirit of it. And we can absorb the way in which, uh, you know, ancient Indian scholars, scientists, uh, engineers were so confident, so bold of their knowledge. Uh, they have this self-confidence, which I will, uh, this is basically what I want to show you today. It's not about the details, and I'm going to skip very quickly about a number over a number of my 108 slides. It's happened to be 108 eventually. Um, I will not spend much time on most of them. But the point is, <clears throat> you see this immense creativity, immense spirit of innovation, and self confidence again. This is what we miss. The old school system, which we are hoping to change, is that, you know, all the useful knowledge was coming from the West. And of course, the West has done great things, but so has India. So why can't we have both? That is the, the question, which uh, the KTPI course was trying to 
begin yeah. to answer. It's the first answer. And then hopefully one day, if we have an ideal, you know, education policy, it will all be there in all the disciplines. And the benefit is that the students will become automatically self-confident. They will feel that they are part of the stream of civilization. You know, we are just in 2023, but it started uh, a few thousand years earlier. And we've had all these great minds creating and sometimes also great hands because let's not forget the craftsmen, the architects, the sculptors, etc. So, you know, it's it gives you this strength that, okay, I'm part of this stream of civilization, therefore I can also achieve something. So this is one of the benefits apart from the knowledge. Now, <clears throat> uh, excuse me for this, this uh, uh, preface, but I thought it was important to set the, the framework, the objective of this course. It's not about cramming your minds with all kinds of tidbits of knowledge. Unfortunately, the evaluation system is still the way it is. That will change eventually in the next few years. But <clears throat> for me, it's not the, you know, the, all the small facts that matter. It's really the spirit of the whole thing. And of course, a, a few great landmarks. So with this long preface, let me share my screen and I, I do hope that you can see my, my title slide, yes. So the topic is other technologies, but I have after checking with uh, after checking with, with Shantiji, I find that uh, metallurgy has not quite been covered. So I will very, very briefly include a few developments. And we start here. Actually, we, we do not exactly start here. We start even a, a little before this. Indus or Harappan or Indus Sarasvati civilization. I just want to mention, I'm not going to read these slides or this text, that technology with humanity is a very, very long story. What is technology? It is anything that modifies the natural environment. Animals also have technology. See the way beavers build dams across rivers, actually amazing dams, amazing technology. So a lot of animals have technology. Humans, therefore, also had from the very beginning. But then, you know, we have the Stone Age. And then, as you can see here, we have the Neolithic, which is basically the appearance of, metal of, of, of agriculture. And this begins in northwest India, today Baluchistan, about 9,000 years ago. And then it spreads. And we don't have to worry about the details now. But this is when human communities settled down. The, 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 the ice age has ended about 10, 12,000 years ago. Rivers are flowing full of water. Uh, population is increasing. The temperature has increased also. And therefore, communities settle. They stop moving from place to place. And they start practicing agriculture. And they need technologies to go with that. So one is pottery, for example. I'll not go extensively into it at all. But the first pottery appears about 8,000 years ago in, in India. First of all, completely made by hand. You can, by hand, you can shape clay and put it in the fire and you get some kind of a pot. And in fact, some of it is already fairly sophisticated. Later on, we will have wheel-based pottery. If you have seen potters today, they have an electric motor rotating a wheel. But till, till you know, maybe 30, 40 years ago, they didn't have an electric motor. They had a kind of pedaling system to make the wheel rotate. But this wheel-based potter, uh, pottery was actually created during the Harappan civilization. So before it, here, it is completely uh, man-made. Now let us move to this Harappan civilization, because this is where we see an explosion of technologies. And, <clears throat> and we see that here, we have something very, very different happening, which is urbanism. You see, the Neolithic is about agriculture, settlements, rural settlements. They can grow into, you know, big villages. They can grow into uh, towns even, but they don't have the concept of cities, you know. So this makes, a, this urbanism is itself a technology. Urban planning is a technology. Architecture is a technology. So obviously, we're not going to cover all this enormous field today. But you can see here, 
in Mohenjo Daro. Let me get a slightly better cursor, perhaps. You can see the, uh, the streets neatly align north and south, east and west, and very geometric series of buildings. But this is the Acropolis or Upper Town. It's not the low town where people are mostly living. This here is for the ruling elite, maybe some high priests, maybe some high administrators, and maybe a few traders. But anyhow, this is what it looks like. And the alignments, I will not go into details, were probably worked out through um, astronomical observations of certain constellations. Uh, because the alignment is extremely precise uh, in, in the east-west uh, direction. So, so th this is another, of course, uh, technology. So now, <clears throat> how did they get those streets so perfectly aligned and with 90 degrees, probably some, through some sort of compasses like this? These are from Lothal in Gujarat. And you can see that these lots here are covering exactly 90 degrees. They are, you see, they are, I don't know, you cannot see me perhaps. Uh, they, they will be giving you exactly right angles. So you can view through the slots and make some alignments. And some of them are also for 45 degrees, uh, 30 degrees sometimes. So anyway, there is a growth in technologies, weight system with some mathematical principle behind them, which I'll not go into, which are essential for the growth of trade. Because when you are trading, you want to be able to measure quantities. Maybe, you know, I'm selling you some rice and you are giving me some, uh, some bronze objects. Maybe the, the price of bronze uh, will be, will be uh, as per its weight. And, and uh, therefore, uh, if somebody can take care of those who, who ask to be admitted, this will be better for me. So, so this is uh, um, how, therefore, a weight system develops. And the beauty here is that it's highly standardized across the entire Harappan civilization. Even in Oman, in the Gulf, um, Persian Gulf, there we find the same Harappan weights there. And it becomes the Oman standard, as archaeologists there call it. So let me move on because, as I said, there's just too much. Uh, but there's also units of distance, you know, linear units of length. And which uh, I have, and a few others, have connected with the hysterical units, which texts, later texts, much later texts, like Arthashastra, that's 2,000 years after the Harappan civilization, have uh, also developed. And there's a historical continuity in this case. Now, I was not initially planning to speak about metallurgy because I thought somebody had done it, uh, but... Uh, it is, in fact, a separate module, which I wrote in the KTPI course. I wrote, actually, those modules on, on science and technology. You see, in the Neolithic period, you do not have metals. People are, Neolithic means new, Neolithic stone. It's still stone-based. And, of course, wood. You will be using wooden clubs, wooden uh, pestles, uh, all kinds of um, wood, wooden instruments. But the, the, the advanced technology is stone. And they can make all kinds of tools with stone. Now, metallurgy, as you can see here, appears about 4,000, 4,500 BCE. And um, this is a big development. Now, all over the world, humanity has followed more or less the same sequence. Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, then Iron Age. These are the broad, I'm not going to too many details, broad, broad sequences. And here we find that the Harappans are very skilled in making bro uh, bronze. But what is bronze? It is copper with tin. All right. Why do we need to add something to copper? Because copper is too soft. And you cannot have all these beautiful tools made of copper. They will just be decorations. You can't use them. They will get worn out too fast. So you need to harden the copper. And this is what Harappans experimented and finally did with mix, by mixing arsenic, uh, tin. So tin is the biggest ingredient in bronze. Nickel, and all of these will create very hard varieties of bronze, which they are using in all these scissors and axes, uh, etc. So let me continue. There will be, of course, 
dishes, more tools, uh, figurines like this bull, beautiful, little, very small, maybe two inches bull from Kalibangan in Rajasthan. And this also leads, because now they are mastering metal, not only copper, bronze, but also gold, silver, um, and, 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 and one or two more metals. And uh, this, but not iron. We are not yet in the iron age. That comes later, which I will not touch upon today because I, I, I was not, uh, I just learned that metallurgy was not uh, dealt with, but you will find in my KTPI module, uh, much on iron, later iron metallurgy, which in India begins about 2000 BC, but really in full spread, maybe 1200, 1300 BC or something like that. Now, ornament making is a craft, as you all know, but this craft cannot happen without technologies. For example, here, this beautiful carnelian. Carnelian is a yellowish sort of agate, but Harappans developed a, some secret technologies to heat it, not secret today, secret in their time, to heat it and turn it a deep red, which people loved, especially in Mesopotamia. The princesses of Mesopotamia loved those long bees, and they were found in a lot of graves there. So now the drilling of it, as you can see, there is a thread passing through, and this is a magnificent belt which represents hundreds of hours of work because the drilling had to be done with, with minutely designed drilling bits of a synthetic hard stone. And, <clears throat> you know, if even if I give you this and a modern electric drill, chances are you will break this long bead at some point. It requires immense skill. And there are people, we have here some archaeologists, we have done detailed studies of this drilling technique. So let me move on because they can't deal with everything. This is some of those found in Mesopotamia. And uh, then, you know, all kinds of decorated beads. And then on the right here, faience. What is faience? Sometimes called proto-glass or, you know, early glass by archaeologists. It's a completely synthetic stone. Completely. You keep grinding some quartz and sand and you you mix it with different uh, pigments and you heat it and fuse it all back together and you can create those magnificent objects. This is a bracelet. It's a, just amazing of perfection and it's a completely synthetic material. So they had all kinds of furnaces to, to, uh, to you know, do justice to uh, this, uh, uh, all these firing processes and creating high temperature, which is necessary to smelt the metals to heat uh, the seals, to heat bricks also sometimes, to heat pots, fire pots, uh, which otherwise would remain very soft clay, all right? So uh, again, we will move on, but all this was the technological background that permitted Harappans located here. I hope you can follow my cursor. This is Northwest India, and all of this down to the Narmada, a little beyond in fact, and uh, even into a little bit of Afghanistan, all of this uh, was the Harappan or Indus or Indus Sarasvati civilization. Sarasvati is flowing here, by the way, parallel to the Indus. And uh, it's called Gagara Crown, this map. And you see the trade networks, all the red arrows are basically trade networks and they keep expanding. Now, agriculture is another technology and the Harappans developed it quite a bit, especially through the use of plows. Plowing is one of their contributions. All over the world, this, these discoveries will also happen independently most of the time. And you find that um, plowing in, you know, increases the yield and, and uh, also controls the weeds and so on and so forth. So they were practicing plow-based agriculture and we have a, even a trace of the ancient in Kalibangan here, I'll not explain fully, but this is a double system of, of, of furrows still practiced while the excavations were going on in the 1960s, which allows intercropping, two crops at a time. So you see that sometimes the agriculture could be quite sophisticated. And this is construction. But you see how these bricks look so modern, and indeed they have the modern proportions, which allows them to be stacked lengthwise to side by side or widthwise 
one across, and this will give good structural uh, stability. So this is actually a, a, a very important discovery of the Harappans, which uh, is uh, called the English bond today in masonry, but actually it should be called the Harappan bond. And it is bonding those bricks in a way that with the minimum amount of bricks, you can get the maximum structural strength. And these proportions are what made it possible. Uh, but sometimes stone, like in Doravira here in Gujarat, uh, where stone was available, in the Indus plains, Sarasati plains, there was almost no stone. So they, 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 they use clay and therefore bricks and ceramics. Here in Dolavira, there is stone, so we find a few beautiful stone structures, which I will not take time to, to uh, <clears throat> detail. And then the sanitation for which the Harappan civilization is famous, because almost every house was connected to a drainage system. You can see it here. This is a small street. You can see the well in this large house, probably some rich, wealthy merchants. They have their own well. This is a small bathroom platform. The water will be drawn, used here. Then it goes under the flooring of the, of the house. It goes below the flooring, below the boundary wall, into a gentle curve with, made with fired bricks, you know, bricks baked in an oven. Otherwise, they would disintegrate. And you have here what is called a sump. And a sump here is meant for all solid waste to drop down, which means that there was a municipal force to regularly inspect those uh, drains and sumps and maintain them in proper order. And archaeologists have proved that the whole system was working properly uh, all, all, all for the whole duration of the Indus civilization. Same thing at Lothal, you see the bathing platforms joining into a common drain that empties into the Lothal Lothian, which I'll show you later on. Now this leads us to another technology, which is very, very important, water management. And I want to spend a few minutes on it. Because, see, the, the spirit, and, and I'm addressing especially here the students and the teachers, you have to always understand the context of India. Before you jump into the details of a technology, look at the broader picture. India is a very climatically diverse and ge geologically diverse subcontinent. It's more than a small country. And therefore, because you have different climates, different monsoons, different dry periods, different, you know, um, coastal climates, Himalayan mountain climates, uh, continental climates, etc. You have different needs of water, of, of water structures. They are not the same in different regions of India. So here we are back at Dolavira, and you see the remnant of a dam, which they created over a Nala. This is a theoretical reconstruction of it. And this dam diverted waters, maybe through such drains, into huge reservoirs, which and also harvesting rainwater, which uh, which probably looks something like that. This is a computer reconstruction, where you see those huge reservoirs. This is another. This is another here, where they would because the the Dolavira is in the run of catch, a very dry region, and this would ensure that the city had a water supply throughout the year. So you see, you cannot have an urbanism, as I said already, without certain developed technologies like agriculture, like transport, I'm coming to it later, like water management and craft technologies and metallurgy and so on. Hmm? Urbanism is necessarily the convergence of all these technologies. Otherwise, you will not have cities. You can still have people happily living in rural communities. There's nothing wrong with that. But we see those cities exploding in the third millennium BC. These are some examples of reservoirs, water structures, all of them interconnected uh, in Dolavira. And this is a typical Harappan well with trapezoid bricks. That was a great invention that would lock because of the trapezoid shape. It would lock together when there was too much pressure of water from the underground <clears throat> soil layers. Uh, because uh, this is in the close to the Indus, and if you have rectangular bricks, you're, they are going to be displaced, pushed inside, and the well will collapse. This is not happening because here it locks all together, as you can visualize. So this was another great technological invention. These are some of the huge reservoirs at uh, Dholavira. One of them has a famous little 
little step well uh, at the bottom, maybe a prototype of future step wells, we don't know. And this is with the hugest reservoir of all. And I will leave now the Harappan civilization to come to other structures like the Gabar Bans of Balochistan, uh, which are simply creating a platform for a mountain stream to partly divert its waters into it through clever management of the levels. And then you can simply grow crops here. You have nothing to do. They'll be watered and they will be fertilized because the, 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 this mountain stream is carrying a lot of sediments. So you, once you have done this structure, uh, and, and lots of them uh, were, were built in, in Baluchistan and other region, then you can sit back and just watch uh, the stream doing all the work. Complex water systems in historical periods. This is first century BCE, Achringwirpur in Allahabad. But you, I will not spend time because the whole functioning of this chain of reservoirs is not fully worked out as yet. IIT Kanpur has some people working on it. This is in Tamil Nadu, the so-called uh, Grand Anikat, uh, restored during Br British times. And actually they called it a dam, but they did not understand that it was not a dam. It was a water diverting structure to split the Kaveri River into two parts and make sure that the southern part watered, irrigated thousands of acres where rice was grown. Without this, all the water would have flowed into the northern stream of the Kaveri and the southern region would not have been you know, so easy to exploit. So here you have a sketch. I think it is in the module, if I remember well. And, and you can uh, study this a little bit further. So I'm skipping those technical details, but lots of other water management structures were in use. Uh, and some of them integrated here like Burhampur during the Mughal era, where you have catchment of water flowing down this, the hills. When you have hills, you can do a lot of water management. E much, so much easier. Hills are natural water harvesters on a big scale. So we, we forget this, you know, we think hydro, hydroelectrical power, yes, that's fine. But the long back, they were exploited also for other reasons. So then the water after due filtration, sedimentation will uh, reemerge here in what will look like a lake, but actually it's completely artificial. So uh, let me continue. Well, some of these uh, underground tunnels were dug for water to pass through. And uh, these were the vents that you could have, might have noticed on the slope, which were meant to equalize the pressure of the air underground. Otherwise, you would have had air locks. So <clears throat> this I will skip. But in Kerala also, from the Western Ghats, they are called surangams, whereas in North India, they are called kanats and, and maybe other terms. And uh, they are usually maintained by a community or a family. And then they feed those kind of tanks, which it, similarly here, it's an artificial tank. Uh, it's not a natural one. And it will be fed by an underground tunnel dug through the hill. So very nice, very clever system. Some of them very, very simple, like this in Rajasthan, where you are forcing the water to percolate, and then it gets filtered. And your well, just across the dam, your well will be fed by this infiltrated water, but you will get very clean. And, and the pure water, which might not be the case in the pond. All the forts had complex water harvesting system, very necessary during times of siege. This is another example from the Miranga fort in Jodhpur. Um, we can't go into all the details, but Jodhpur has a very complex integrated system. You can see here all, of, all across the, the city and with canals, reservoirs, uh, underground reservoirs, etc. So these people, these engineers, they were really hydraulic engineers, were able to really conceptualize, plan, understand the needs of the population and give something that met those needs, you see? So this is what engineers are supposed to do. Okay, I'll not uh, read this out. You can see this later. I don't mind sharing my slides. Uh, 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 this tells the story of one of these uh, beautiful uh, step wells. This is in Jodhpur. Uh, which, which are actually interconnected, but you will not notice it. And they are also social places. See, I would request our teachers especially to make an effort 
whenever you teach a technology to bring out the social context. See, here you have people who are going to come in the evenings. They will sit on those, on those stairs. They will gossip. The place is cooler than, than elsewhere. Jodhpur, God knows it is hot in, in summer. This is several degrees cooler. And people meet. And this, this is very important. You know, this bonds the society together, right? So um, then other structures like here in Bengal, where here you don't have mountains, but then you have a mighty river flowing and you can cut across an opening in the embankment and you can use this water driven by the force of the river for irrigating fields and thousands of acres used to be irrigated like this. This is in Gujarat, my own photos, where again, water is diverted here from the river at the back which is a, a small Sarasvati river, and it is filtered here. This is a settling pond, and then it flows into various channels. A fascinating structure, which I don't have time to describe, but here, and this is another aspect for the teachers especially to keep in mind, not only the social aspect, but also the philosophical, spiritual, religious context of all these technologies. For example, here, because water is sacred, you have these three little shrines here in Gujarat to Ganga Yamuna Saraswati. Now, Ganga Yamuna Saraswati, of course, everybody will say, oh, Prayag. Yes, Prayag, but not only Prayag. Many parts of India have a symbolic Ganga Yamuna Saraswati confluence, right? So, so this is, you know, to remind people that, that water is, has to be worshipped, is sacred. And this whole famous Rani Kiwab, just behind this uh, structure I was showing you at Patan, uh, is, is a magnificent example of art. So it's social context, philosophical, conceptual, spiritual, religious, and artistic. All of this is together. Therefore, we have insisted, I hope, in KTPI modules, that all these modules are multidisciplinary. They cut across fields that our educational system has rigidly compartmentalized, right? Here you have technology, fantastic well. Uh, and fantastic structures of, of uh, sculptor, sculpted panels. And you have also water, which, which is useful for the people. So this is just, and, and this is, you know, while you go down towards the well, amazing structure, sculpted panels of great beauty, which remind us that this is about water because apsaras here, these are apsaras, are actually water semi-divine beings, water nymphs. So anyway, we can go on like this. Uh, more step wells. Uh, this is in Ahmedabad. And um, very complex architectural structures. And um, uh, this one is a, a tank at Modera, also in Gujarat, where uh, this is, you know, multiple use. These temple tanks are for religious rituals, but they are also for water conservation, right? So again, multiple use, cutting across disciplines. And this is the deepest um, step well in India, uh, in Rajasthan. Amazing structure. So, you know, our engineers, and this is an aerial view, really, we're not scared of, this one is in Vijayanagar, we're not scared of uh, bold innovations, bold technologies, and uh, amazing results. And ultimately, in South India, we have this tradition of large temple tanks, which also fulfill the double role of you know, ritual, uh, water uh, purification and so on, as well as water harvesting on a big scale. Then again, uh, more complex water structures in the form of uh, interconnected tanks. Uh, they are not square. This is just to show their relative areas. They are not square. They are any shape, any shape. But you can do that across an entire river basin, which is the case here in the Palar River Basin. And, and the, the fact that they are interconnected means that the water will be much more, much better distributed. If one area receives a lot of rainfall, the other has not, there will be communication between the two and no water will be lost. So much more efficient water harvesting than even what we have today dams, but I think I will skip this in the interest of time, but this dam has been there for 1200 years uh, in stone, and it's right in, the, in, in Delhi, south of Delhi, and you can go and see it. And 
you know, more lakes, many of them artificial, uh, created by kings, or very often in Gujarat and Rajasthan by queens. And we have inscriptions to prove it. And again, the religious aspect is, is immediately there, the spiritual aspect, because water is sacred and we have to have that feeling. So <clears throat> more structures, these are at Vijayanaga aqueducts to transport water when the natural slope does not permit it. So you create an artificial slope through these water, stone water aqueducts and so on. And water lifting mechanisms, I think I'm going to move a little faster. This is the Persian wheel, which is still in use in some parts today, where you can rotate this wheel through it with bullocks, for example, and the buckets which are tied to it will lift the water, you see. So this is a beautiful, simple design, and it's spread all over India. But don't forget that technologies don't always have to be very sophisticated. For example, in the Northeast, you have these bamboo pipes, you know, open slits of bamboo, which can carry water from small mountain springs kilometers away to the small village settlement of a particular tribe. And it's enough for them. Well, if it's enough, it's appropriate. So this is what Ernst Schumacher, the great uh, author of Small is Beautiful in the 1970s called appropriate technologies. If they are sufficient for their needs, why should you go and build, a, for example, a huge dam there? They don't need it. It's actually going to destroy more than help. Textile is another field where we have very early beginnings in the Harappan civilization. The cloth does not remain except for a few fibers, but evidence of cloth pressed on clay remains. And, and we can count the, you know, the frequency of the threads and so on. So uh, uh, Harappans grew cotton, they were among the first, but they also were able to harvest raw wild silk. And this is a recent discovery, recent discovery. This, you can see the scale one millimeter. This is a microbead, just one millimeter long. And there is a silk thread. I don't know if you can figure out what is one millimeter. Please, all, all children here, put your fingers like I do, together, almost touching the index and the thumb. This is one millimeter. This is the size of this bead at the bottom. Through it, there is a, a hole. And uh, then this thread of, of silk, because silk is so much more uh, resistant and tougher. Okay, so <clears throat> now transport is uh, uh, also a very ancient technology, which begins with the Neolithic. You need to carry stuff. You're practicing agriculture. You can't carry, uh, you know, your harvest on your head all the time. So here, if also to carry water, perhaps, uh, these uh, bullock carts were developed. And these toy carts, Harappan toy carts, very small, for, to amuse kids, uh, give us a very good idea of what the real ones may have looked like. Hmm? So this is more and more, uh, you know, excavated bits and pieces of toy carts. Uh, this one is in copper, but this must have been a ceremonial toy, uh, a ceremonial chariot. Uh, not an ordinary one. And wheels which perhaps had spokes. This is what these designs suggest. So continuity with the bullock are still used till recently in Sindh. And these actually, you know, it, it may look like a very humble technology and people sometimes use bullock cart very pejoratively. They will say, oh, you are taking us back to the time of the bullock cars. Bullock cars were advanced technology. And we have a French scholar Jean Deloche, who passed away a couple of years ago at over 90 years of age. And he did a fantastic study of Indian roads, road making, road building, transport, including bullocks, shipping, ports, ports, fortifications, and bridges. These are the six technologies I just remember, but he did more. Amazing documentation. And he had no such prejudice that these are, you know, humble technologies. In fact, he found that they were quite sophisticated. So I'm going to skip those details because, you know, in different parts of India, for different kinds of soil and for different purposes, you will have different sizes of wheels. You will have also different sizes for the body of your, your, your cart. And of course, more recently, the introduction of tires uh, also changed the whole technology. 
So uh, I, I, I'm just skipping the, but you see, this is some of these uh, papers that he wrote he, because even the stone wheels fascinated him and they are used only today, only for ceremonial temple cars. You know, when you take out the deity on a procession, some of the tradition today, most of it, most of them have modern wheels, but till recently they still had those amazing, very, very heavy stone wheels. And they are also portrayed uh, on the temple art. So this is from Hampi. And uh, then also these um, cars could be made into, don't think that they were always pulled by bullocks or horses or asses. Sometimes they were pulled by humans. Like here, for example, to move a 50 ton pillar uh, in Firuzshah's time, and there are texts explaining this, um, you needed such a, a platform with wheels, 10 wheels, and those 10 wheels had 10 ropes, they were pulled by human beings. So this is and sometimes by bullocks, but sometimes also by human beings. Or the same with cannons, transport of cannons. Now you see routes and roads, as I was saying, uh, See, see you, 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 you need transport to move along these roads. And this is the big axis northwest called sometimes in the ancient literature Uttara Uttarapatta. And this is this north-south axis, Dakshinapatta. But you also have a lot of miscellaneous roads and India developed a very, very vast network uh, to communicate with the rest of the world. And it was connected with the silk routes, which are here and connect all the way to the Mediterranean world. So very complex uh, system, very, you see, this is just a small view of the, the Ganges plains. And you can see the, the density of the road network, without which the trade could not flourish. Uh, ship making, and uh, this begins also at Lothal, uh, sorry, uh, where you have this famous dockyard where boats were coming to load and unload goods. And you know, these networks were connected all the way to Mesopotamia. This is the top of the Persian Gulf and Mesopotamian cities are full of Harappan goods, seals, ornaments, uh, pottery sometimes also. So this is how it all uh, developed. And we have a few impressions of Harappan boats uh, here, but, uh, <clears throat> Not these are these are river boats because they have a flat bottom. The Harappans must have had seafaring boats, but we don't have any representations, depictions of them. Rather, some very very crude and simple uh, boats, river boats, small ones, larger ones, and the boats are actually in continuity with today's boats, traditional ones plying on the Indus, um, and with the common you know central cabin here and very raised sides like here, and then this, these two uh, oars uh, to govern uh, the boat. So this continuity also is very interesting. Eventually in the historical period, it will lead to very extensive trade. And this is a map drawn out of a Greek navigation manual called Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. Eritrean Sea is this, the Arabian Sea today where this text details all the ports and you, there's a huge density of ports on the Indian coast from Gujarat all the way down to Kerala and all the way up to Bengal. All the ports are listed, described and all the goods because India traded in, in spices, in textiles, in jewelry, um, a pre, a, and sometimes also in metal and so on. So, all these Indian goods have been found in all these regions. So India was a dominant economic force at that time. I'm going to skip uh, this, but remember that in these days, currency began to be used and uh, there is no currency during Harappan times. <clears throat> and the initial currency was those small, beautiful Kori shells, which were rare in this region, but common in, in India and the Maldives. So this was actually the currency that sailors were using. I'm going to skip some details, but remember India was an economic force. Uh, it is here in yellow, uh, whereas China I have put in red. And you can see that Europe is nowhere uh, until the colonial age when, of course, they plunder so much the colonies that their wealth increases while the colonies' wealth de decreases. Hmm? 
So anyway, these are some representations. We have now a few of ships with two masts, and these are seafaring. You see, the hull is not flat. And uh, three masts here in Ajanta and so on. And lots of literature. This is another one from Ajanta, beautiful, beautiful painting. Uh, we have lots of literature on shipping. This is from a, a Borobudur in Indonesia, probably an Indian ship arriving there. And uh, this is from Orissa, uh, a smaller boat uh, with uh, to transport a ceremonial person. Uh, and um, this is also from Orissa. And this one is from Bengal. So you see that shipping becomes a very important uh, activity in India. Uh, this one is from Tamil Nadu. So, uh, so you see, um, and this is the arrival of the ship. You know, there's a big rope to, to tie it now to the shore. And, and these are the sailors inside the ship. Okay. So, and this is a view of in 16th century Calicut, not far from where many of you might be. Uh, we have a school from Kanur, so not very far. And you see 16th century, you can compare with today's Calicut, very, very different, no doubt. You have the European ships here, okay? Portuguese, most probably Portuguese or Dutch. You have the Indian ships here. These this curved sails are Indian, you see? And you have a shipping yard here where you have the ships being built. So, so all this is, this is a European painting. Uh, and and uh, so we have lots of documents on Indian shipping industry. So I'm going to stop here because it's already 15, 15 minutes or so. And you see, what I want to say is that I could have continued with more technologies like jewelry, like dyeing, the art of using pigments, to create rich textiles or paintings of different colors. India had a lot of variety of pigments and some odd technologies like ice making, you know, in, in Rajasthan, even in summer, you can make ice making in ancient times, if you know how. And the Mughals had the ice chambers where this ice was carefully harvested sheet after sheet. It's about digging a hole uh, in the desert and with straw creating layers where you keep some water on a very flat dish and the condensation early in the morning will turn you'll get one or two millimeters of ice you have to come and harvest that even if if in midday you're going to have 40 degrees you can still do that uh, so <clears throat> this was kept in chambers because the mogul rulers were very fond of ice sherbets you know called sherbets so anyway, so many other small technologies uh, which uh, we don't pay enough attention to, but which are very valuable. So I just wanted to give you a taste. You know, it's it's uh, again I, I I I can I mean because I've been running here a course on ancient Indian science and technology, uh, not anymore, but I used to run it, and I can I can give you five hundred slides, but it makes no difference. The point is to understand. Let me conclude on this. To understand that people understood the needs, local needs, regional needs, and they could they could customize their technologies to those regional needs. Number one, so appropriate technology. Number two, for wealth, you know, all these, for example, jewelry, rich textiles which were exported, these are all luxury goods. So it's not as if Indians were ascetics. They were not ascetics. I mean, they were monks and they were monasteries, but that, that's the margin of the society. You know, it's not even 1% of the society, probably. So they, they, they enjoy luxury and, you know, artha, uh, artha and kama, it's, it's part of the Purush artha. So we can enjoy all these, these pleasures, but they were also making to export and therefore to bring back other luxury goods uh, from, from the Mediterranean or from China or from so there was a little bit of import also, but most of it, India was a giver, giver of technologies, giver of goods, giver of knowledge also. Like in science, in mathematics and astronomy, very, very well documented. And of course, in literature, the spread of Mahabharata Ramayana out of India is, is enormous, all across India and beyond. Panchatantra stories in, in the Arabian countries and whatnot. 
So we can go on forever, but the point is that, you know, this was this, um, uh, India was a leading country. Okay, we say Vishwaguru, I don't mind, but we have to understand what, what is behind those, those slogans ultimately. Uh, and um, the point was that <clears throat> India was really uh, a place of uh, enormous creation, enormous experimentation from the craftsmen to the astronomers, to the weavers, to the, um, uh, you know, the potters and whatnot, uh, people could create the, um, uh, as much as they liked. And, and there was, there was uh, therefore, uh, enormous variety of technologies, which even I don't even know. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely endless. So there's a lot of literature. Some of it is listed at the end of the KTPI modules. And that's even you know, just, again, a very small part of the available literature. So this is the spirit, creativity, innovation, daring, self-confidence, and, uh, <clears throat> and then the social context, the philosophical, religious, spiritual context, which is very often behind the technologies or fused into them, uh, and, and the artistic. You see, they, the Indians value beauty. Hmm? Satyam Shivam Sundaram. We forget Sundaram. We of, of course often forget Satyam. So that's another <laughs> problem. But uh, Sundaram is gone. Our cities are not beautiful. Rarely, rarely. Most of our cities are, you know, just chaos of concrete. So, so ancient Indians value Sundaram. And you will find most, uh, most of the creations have an aesthetic value also. I'll stop with this, and um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you so much, Michelle Dee. It was so inspiring to listen to you. It was absolutely, you can go on and on, and we are all ready to listen to you. It was absolutely amazing. So, uh, our children, you have any questions? Any teachers have any questions? You can unmute and ask the question. Ma'am, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah. Uh, Namaste, ma'am. And then um, splendid session as usual. I mean, I should thank CCMT and especially you. Today, uh, uh, we witnessed completely a Vasudeva Kutumbakam, our global citizen concept. Seriously, more than this, I don't say anything. It's a splendid uh, experience for all of us, sir. We should thank uh, for this session. Every line is inspiring. I have got a doubt, sir, like whether I'm correct or not, please let me know. Namaste, sir. Uh, when um, uh, It's a doubt for me from the childhood, early childhood, when I started to read the Harappan civilization. The figure in uh, the bullock cart shape is semi-circular. And the person sitting and riding the cart will not have the load of that uh, harvest or something. How could he manage or any such thing is there? Why it is in semi-circular shape, why not in flat shape? Um, there are a few cars which are flat, both shapes. And uh, uh, the problem is, Suvaranji, that we do not have the actual remains of the cars. We have only the toy cart models that they made to, you know, to amuse the children, probably. Uh, if I, let me see, if I quickly find it, I will share because I, I passed uh, fairly fast uh, uh, indeed, but I will share one example <clears throat> of flat one. And you see, they may have been for different purposes. For example, if you want to carry sand, uh, you, you, having a curved shape is actually interesting. Um, uh -huh, this is it, this is it. Let me, let me share this, this one quickly, this one slide without, you see here, um, so you can see that this one is almost flat and this one is flat. It's actually a container. You see, it's very different. Uh, these are indeed curved. This one again is flat. So the problem is, you know, as always, archaeology gives you only a small proportion of the actual remains. We should not extrapolate. And they could have been used for different purposes. Um, you see, maybe, for example, the curved one was, was like, like this one was safer to transport people, they would not so easily fall. Uh, or, or even for if you have a you know, lot of straw you to harvest, let us say, you can have these sticks here to, to keep it all together and, and maybe it will it will actually stay better with the curved structure. So they must have experimented. It is true that here 
we represent a, a heavily curved structure, but we should not uh, generalize. You see, we oh. it's impossible for me to give you statistics like 37% of the cards were curved. And, and also it will depend possibly of the nature of the soil, which is what uh, Jean Deloche, this French, um, uh, he wrote a whole book on wheeled transport in ancient India, fascinating book in English, uh, which uh, which is dealing mostly with the historical period. I mean, he does refer to the Harappan one, but most of it. And he shows the Im am amazing diversity of shapes, sizes, types of wheels, etc. And he's, you know, makes an analysis in terms of climate, nature of the soil, and also type of road. If you have a paved road or if you have a mud road, it's different. So, so therefore, it's the answer is diversity in, in a word. Got it, sir. Completely got it. With your permission, I would like to extend one little more thing. Certainly. Uh, uh, you have uh, explained uh, the teachers that uh, touch the philosophical aspect and religious aspect. That's wonderful, sir. Uh, recently, we had a session. And then in that, we were educated that our system is reward-based system, not process-based system. But still, in the end minds, when they have the reward, they will do the things uh, furthermore. So uh, I did not. I did not. I did not catch the first word. You said it is not reward based. It is. It is reward based system in India, not process based system. Not uh, process. Not process based system. That is okay. what the takeaway we got from that. Shantima, with your permission, I would like to request through you that uh, arrange small small competitions or something so that children will be more motivated to do more KTPI uh, things. Like if they get something, <laughs> some small little recognition, they will do it more better. So like uh, through the stall works, maybe you can think and do some small little competition. So what, what is your suggestion, Michelle Ji? We are wanting numbers for KTPI. <laughs> we are also promoting yeah, that. Yeah. That's what she's saying. Yeah. We want yes. more, more students so yeah, that right. they, they'll be happy to attend and then get guided. You see, I, I wish, and this was one of my many projects which I could not uh, complete. I think today the, the way is to really create short videos, but of good quality. The problem is you have a lot of short videos on the internet, but many, many of them are actually not very genuine. You have a lot of enthusiastic people. Their motivation may be good initially, and they will rush to make all kinds of silly claims. Tall claims, you know, that uh, ancient Indians uh, uh, had advanced technology. Uh, they, some even say vimanas. Uh, vimanas are purely conceptual. They are not real. They are not physical objects. Uh, they cannot be because you cannot create a flying object in ancient times without a lot of advanced technology, which did not exist. So first of all, it has to be genuine, realistic, but there's so much that is really exciting, actually. Even the Bullockart technology, if you do it well, you can turn it into something really interesting. Because you can have mini projects, you can have some small experimentation, you can take the students out to, the, to a village, observe, discuss with, because there are still a few villages, within a few years, this will completely disappear. But even when I was living near Coimbatore, uh, there were, there were Bullockarts especially to take the sand from the mountain, yeah. hill, hill streams and things like that. So, so you can do, you know, observe it. You have to actually change the whole pedagogy. So start, I would say we have to create short videos. And well, there are people who are trying to uh, on, on various aspects and those short videos, okay, they can be, you know, we can, uh, I don't like, when we glorify too much. Because what I always say is don't glorify, just put the real facts in an interesting way. That's more than enough. And students will automatically realize the greatness. This has happened with my students here at IIT Gandhinagar. And I don't think that IIT students are any different at that level from you know school students. So first of all, it's, it's an effort on our part to create good material in, in a way that, uh, you know, short videos can be made out of that and they can be made really interesting, but they should be thoroughly genuine. Hmm? And lots of videos on the internet today about ancient Indian, you know, achievements and so on. The, the notions are not properly digested and sometimes they are 
absolutely incorrect also. So, so first genuine, secondly, well designed and in, you know, interestingly done. Maybe Chinmaya could envisage you know, the other day there was a Chanakya University being launched in, in, in Bangalore and I was very glad to be sitting next to the person, I forget his name just now, who, who the filmmaker who did the Chanakya series in collaboration with Chinmaya on Upanishad Ganga. Hmm? And I'm sorry, yeah, it was a Chanakya series earlier and he did also, uh, he did also the Upanishad Ganga with Chinmaya with, all, with some of, of you. Chandra Prakash Tivedi. Yes, exactly. Chandra Prakash Tivedi. I had a chat with him. And, uh, you know, we would need to do, to. Uh, this is an idea I throw now. I've had it for some time, but I, I have too many things on me and I can't just do justice to all of this. Getting a good filmmaker and a solid team of scholars who can really identify themes and good resource material and it needs a bit of research, maybe one, two years uh, of research. And then, you know, you prepare three minute videos and maybe 15 minute videos also. The three minute videos can be used, you know, to, to draw a lot more young people at, at all levels of education. And, and then the whole thing, the whole challenge is teacher training also, because the teacher has to have digested the material so well and the teacher must have got excited also in the process, you know. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. The more you study what is there, the, the more you will get excited because the more you realize the innovation. If you just have dry facts and figures, it's not going to work. You know, neither the teacher nor the student will be interested. So this is the challenge we, we are facing because this whole discipline of, let's call them Indian army systems, if you like, in lower school stages, we call it simply knowledge of India in NEP. This is the term we have adopted finally. But in higher classes, we can say Indian knowledge systems. And, you know, all this has been thrown out of the system after independence and um, uh, a little before also. And, and that's why we have to catch up with, with, and it's a big challenge. You see, we have to recreate a whole field of, of education uh, which which has been non-existent. Therefore, we have to put in a little more effort. This is my advice, but you know, sometimes also um, the whole thing should be not book based, but hands on. So, how oh, do right. you create? How do you create small projects for students to work on? For example, can they try some weaving themselves? You know, the hand looms of the Harappans were just just hand looms. I mean, they could fit on. On my desk here, even less than that, probably. We don't have them. We don't know how they were, but they were crude compared to later. Can you try, can you have a pottery uh, workshop? Can you try to make some toy, some toy cards, you know, some, some bullo cards in, in, uh, in small size? Can you, because, okay, experimenting with metals, a bit difficult at school and maybe even a bit dangerous. You need to handle high temperature and things like that. So safety uh, will be a concern. Uh, but, um, but you know, there's so much that can be uh, um, tried and then again, uh, take them to a local craftsman. Luckily, we still have craftsmen in India. Discuss with them, make a report. Uh, so to me, a big chunk of, and, and I'm not sure that the current CBSE uh, pedagogy allows room for this, though we have put a lot of project ideas, if you remember in the KTPI modules, in that spirit. But to me, uh, something like KTPI, half of it should be hands-on projects, visits, field visits, and so on. So, uh, you know, the, I think it's, it's the, this whole effort is, is what is needed. And uh, it's going to take a bit of time. I don't expect that, you know, overnight we can, uh, you know, have a perfect uh, set of teachers who will be, it takes time and they have to educate themselves also. So therefore, we would need, in addition, to create teacher guides where we have for the teachers a number of hints and guides and some supplementary material which they should read, not the students, but they should read and digest. And once in a while, you know, now there is a, luckily a wealth of um, good videos by good scholars, but they are a little bit advanced most of the time. So that's more for the teachers. I have a plan which I, I think I will execute 
of turning all my uh, courses here, three, three courses. First of all, we have the Indian Knowledge Systems course, but that's more for advanced teach students. And videos are already online. We have six years of videos on online. But I want to, because my course is really designed for students who don't know anything. So there's one course on Indian civilization. It's a very broad, comprehensive course, and one on science and technology in ancient India, and another one on Indian ethics, systems of ethics. I want to turn them all into full-fledged video recordings, which will be available. So this kind of resource needs to be created because the teachers can then at least more easily, uh, you know, some of my lectures could even be accessible to school children at, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, but others may not be. So, but for teachers, they should be always. Hmm? So we have to keep creating good material and fighting against uh, the tendency of, you know, taking shortcuts and uh, uh, creating, in, and I don't want to give names, but, you know, trying to impress the public by how great India was. You don't need to impress. You don't need Absolutely. to impress. You don't need to do anything. Just just do solid work and that will do all the rest. Perfect, uh, Michelle. I totally, totally agree what you mentioned. Uh, there is a tendency for people to impress children with the glory, glorify and not really give the facts to them. I think it's a very ins beautiful insight that you gave. I think we will take it up. I mean, we've been, this one question has been in our minds, how to make children take, in, uh, you know, more excited about it. Uh, creating excitement in children, I think we'll, we'll go a long way in uh, uh, making a, a platform for children to know and get to know. I think it was really, really what you said. The last piece was really an insight for me also uh, with so many schools working with the Chinmaya education uh, movement. I think we need to think about how to excite them and they find out more. They do research. They do find out. We have to go into that uh, mode. That mode is really what we need to take off. Because this one question everybody asks. What will I get studying KTPI? <laughs> Which uh, you get stuck with there. <laughs> well, not... I, I, I started with that, Shantiji, to some extent. Okay. okay. Uh, that, um, uh, you know, why why will I get, shall I say, why will I get by studying history? Why will I Please. get by studying geography? What, what Do I need history? I can always Google. I can always read a Wikipedia article on, on uh, you know, Vijayanagar Empire if I want. Geography, well, we have Google Maps now. Do I really need to study geography? <laughs> uh, do I need to study literature? What use is it going to be for me if I get a job in uh, you know, IT? Do I really need to study literature or languages and so on? Even mathematics. Uh, I, we have here, I was challenging my IT students here the other day. I said, you know, some of you are in mechanical engineering, bioengineering. And you're going to US, for USPC exam, you're going to sit behind a, a, a desk moving files all of, your, all of your life. Why do you have to study this? You're wasting <clears> your time. <throat> I was just provoking them, you know? Yeah. And um, the point is that uh, we have again to decide what education is for. If education is just for getting a job, then we should not have education at all. We should have training centers from the beginning. We should have skilling centers and you, you, you know, at age five, you decide whether he's going to be an engineer or she's going to be, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> a doctor or, or whatever, or a bank employee and so on. And you just train them. And at, at the age of 12, 13, they, can, they have enough to start their, their job. Why not? So obviously education is meant to build up more than skills <clears throat> and also, you know, the development of the child, the cognitive faculties, the the full round personality and and there's so much in ktpi in terms of aesthetics uh, philosophical systems literature all of these give so much of value and and you know it it really enriches you education is for enriching your personality and letting it blossom that's all now if you know i've seen so many of these young because here in it it is so striking these boys and girls, they, they have been in coaching centers for two years. They don't know anything about the world. They don't know anything about India, except what they had to cram uh, at the plus two exam. And they come here. And when I keep throwing questions at them about facts about India, which everybody should know, 
They don't know anything whatsoever. And the tragedy is that many of them get jobs into industry, into IT, and after a few years, they have a personal crisis. Either they are dismissed because now, you know, firing <laughs> employees is very common in corporate world. And then they are on the street and they, they have not even learned the culture of saving money. So, so they don't know what else to do. Or they have a, you know, a, a, a love crisis or they have a depression for whatever reason it may be. And they can't cope with it. They can't cope with it because nobody has ever told them how to cope with 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 challenges of life whether they are personal or not you see you may have a, a social challenge also created by any kind of situation so so unless you have a deeper roots and deeper culture you as a human being i can tell all the children here will struggle in life and uh, that's why you know we have 5000 young people committing suicide every year in india Actually, much more. Actually, much more. Why do they commit suicide? For the silliest of reasons. Because they have failed an exam. So what? So what if you fail an exam? What does it matter? Because they are a friend that they will fail an exam. Because the teacher has scolded them. Because their parent has scolded them. Because they are forced to study something they don't want to study. All these statistics are there. It's, it's so, so, so sad. And uh, we could avoid all of this if we had a proper education system that tells the children, you're not here for a job. Yes, yes, you will get a job. Don't worry. But you're not here to, to get a job. You are here to grow, to enrich, to develop your mind, and also to become a, 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 you know, a, a all-round, strongly rooted human being, because then you will be able to face life. Getting a job will not let you face life. That's my answer. Thank you, Michel G. That was really brilliant. Whatever you said makes so much of sense to me, at least. Uh, it's, it's such so much of uh, logically you are talking about the wisdom that's what we need to have. Uh, can any of the children want to ask any question? If anybody is wanting to ask, I'd anything? love to have some questions from the children. Yeah, students. Yeah. Yeah, Sanskriti. Yes, Sanskriti. Uh, so, I've always seen those common com compasses where it's like north, south, east, west, written. But today you showed us that compass, some, which is something unique from Lothal. Uh, could you please briefly explain how the how did they use it? Like, there was not, nothing, meant that, no, nothing mentioned in the compass and was literally not, uh, like, it uh, to me, it was just a piece of stone. So, how, the, how, how is it used? Okay, um, I will I will come back to the slide in in half a second. Um, uh, this of, co of course, uh, Sanskriti. I will I was moving a little fast, so therefore, I will now sh explain a little more in half a minute. And <clears throat> these are some of the compasses which have been found in Lothal. They are made of bone or ivory. I think uh, not sure. And you see, this is a scale in centimeter here, uh, down on the right. So this is about uh, one, two, three, four, five centimeter, let us say, diameter. Now, you will notice that there are slits. You see one slit here, one slit here, one, etc., etc. And the slits are not always as 90 degrees. Like these two slits, one and two, are exactly at 90 degrees. So <clears throat> when you are designing a street, let us say, before the buildings are built, you will be putting it, let us say, on a stool, and you can tell uh, the workers, you know, to draw a rope uh, alongside, and you will control the alignment of the rope with the slit, and then, then you will just move yourself, take the other slit, you are standing at the crossroad, and you can tell the workers to align the, the rope, because otherwise, on the ground, they will not be able to do it accurately. So some of those slits are at 90 degrees. Others, I think this one on the right, are also at 45 degrees. And if I remember well, there's one which has 30 degrees, so 30, 60, uh, uh, and so on, 90, and it goes and it continues. So it is the assumption of the archaeologist is that this must have been used as compasses. They have nothing to do with the compasses that you use at school today, of course. 
but there are kinds of compasses to determine angles. Otherwise, it's a little bit difficult. Of course, you could conceive. In fact, this is typically the kind of project I would give to students. I would tell them, now you give on the playground of the school, you design two kind of lanes, small footpaths, let us say. Design them at 90 degrees exactly. And you can't use your mobile phone. You can't use your school compasses. And you tell me how you're going to do that. Now, you could use knowledge from geometry. There's a way to do it. But maybe it happens you didn't have that knowledge. So think of different ways. Come back to me with five ways of creating those two footpaths at 90 degrees. That's a small project, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting, it's exciting. And this is how I think we, we best learn. So I hope I have answered your question, Sanskriti. Any other question? Anyone has uh, any student? Arundhati Amma want to say something? Yeah, yeah I, just, I just wanted to, uh, Michelle Ji, thank you very much. Just wanted to ask, uh, uh, you know, apprenticeship was a very, very big manner of passing on of knowledge. Right now, what has happened is knowledge is being passed on by people who really don't know the subject and are just acquiring it from books themselves, never having experienced uh, 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 any aspect of that knowledge uh, in practical terms. Whereas, um, as you said, like uh, uh, taking a chameleon and that length of a chameleon and being able, like right now, uh, uh, recently, that means as of a month ago, I gave certain uh, coral beads and the workers have made, have used so many beads through which they could not pass a single thread and have wasted, have created waste. That means the skills that the workers had because they are not being trained by the apprenticeship method that was the same. Because I remember uh, earlier jewelry, which was so absolutely fantastic. So, uh, uh, so uh, I would, uh, I would, you know, and uh, the, uh, the, aspect that you said about having kids create pottery uh, with their hands create a pot now a potter's wheel and a potter's this and having them create suddenly you come to know what is weight what will stand what will with, not withstand how it will collapse it, uh, I um, during my PhD I needed some way out from the overthinking and overheated head Okay, so I joined a pottery class that went three hours uh, of every week. And I realized that my pot of this size was so heavy. And the reason for that heaviness is because the walls were so thick. If you, if I had to make a pot of this size in which like uh, 10 liters or 15 liters of water was carried, the weight and my small pot was the same because of the lack of skill. So suddenly you realize a whole lot of respect for the ones who can create uh, 20 foot horses uh, that you see strewn across the absolutely. landscape of, of Tamil Nadu yes, and yes, how absolutely. they withstand. Mm -hmm. And there is a whole respect born of what those ancients created and what the present time people can not create. Uh, and from that arises a whole understanding that unless you work with the material, there is no way you can have respect for the people who have worked and created such masterpieces. Absolutely, Arunati ji, you are quite right. And in the ancient period, uh, this apprenticeship would be imparted in two ways. So one, of course, was the traditional, you know, father to son or small gurukula kind of a thing where you have a few, a few people be, being trained by a, crafts, a craftsperson. And this still happens in a few traditional craft communities, you know, where people have to come and sit and they have to practice. There was also with the Buddhist institutions, especially at Nalanda, there was this kind of semi-institutionalized teaching of the craft. Because in the curriculum of Nalanda University, which we have thanks to Chinese pilgrims in particular, uh, it is mentioned that crafts will be one of the topics taught. And I'm sure it was not bookish. <laughs> they could not have had it uh, in a bookish way. So, so uh, I think that also uh, helped to propagate. And sometimes also texts were written 
to, to help convey this knowledge. So the world is a multiplicity of ways, but you know, ultimately it is the hands-on method which, which is indispensable. And that is why national education policy, if you read the document, makes a lot of emphasis on hands-on, project-based, and you know, moving away from bookish and textbook-centric education. Though we want to produce very, very good textbooks, that will be the job of NCRT, and we are creating the frameworks for NCRT to, to base their textbooks on. Yet, uh, for example, we have suggested strongly that the textbook should not be present in the, in the classroom. That in future, the teacher should not use the textbook at all in the classroom. And some innovative schools are already doing that. Nor should the student bring the textbook to the classroom. The textbook is at home. It's for supplementary reading. It's for further information. It's for preparing. Sometimes you can also read before the class. Depends on what the teacher wants and asks. But we are trying to discourage teachers from using the textbook in class. We want the teacher to have absorbed the topic so well that it comes out. Maybe the teacher can have a few notes in front of her, but few bullets, a few, so that no, some important points may not be forgotten, but not a textbook. And especially not the, the way of, you know, open the textbook on page 156, and then uh, let me write it out. What is the use? Then we don't need a teacher for that. So, so the whole pedagogy has to change and it will come back closer uh, to, and you see there's also a very strong emphasis on vocational education in the NEP. We want to reintegrate vocational education right from the lower classes, not when they are about to leave school. And therefore, the dignity of, of, of vocational education, the dignity of learning material things, the dignity of learning to repair a plug, to, to you know, a, a leak of water, and, and all kinds of other things, including crafts. So all this is part of NEP. And we're trying to struggle making space for all this and therefore cutting down the old curriculum by 30 to 50%. If we cannot succeed in cutting down, reducing the curriculum load, and CRT is collaborating in that, we won't make space for all these other things. So, so the spirit is there. Now let us move towards the implementation. Thank you, Arunet. There are loads of expectation on the new curriculum framework that's coming up. The yes, policy yes. is so exciting. <coughs> National yes. education policy is so very exciting. It is exciting, but it is a, a, a car without wheels. Now uh, we try, we curriculum to, framework. We are trying right. to make the wheels. <laughs> I'm sure it will come up. Thank you so much, Mr. Ji. It was wonderful having you here with us. Thank, and, you. Uh, Thank you, Shantiji. Thank you. Thank you so all much. Of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to everybody here. And uh, can we close with the Shanti part? Wish you good luck, children. All of you, those who are appearing this year board exam, my best of wishes, best wishes to all of you. Uh, and uh, thank you all. So let's all, uh, can we close with the Shanti part? Michelji, you have anything else to say? Can we close? No. Thank you and all the best. All my good wishes. And let us keep working on. Yeah. on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you Shantiji, for having me. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Om Purnamadha Purnamidam Purnat Purnamadashate Purnasya Purnamadhaya Purnameva Vasishyate Om Shanti 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 Parihiyom Shri Guru Purnamadha Parihiyom are you? And thanks to everybody. Thanks, Sarandati Amma, Srinathji, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vishalji, once again. Thank you. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you, Shantiji. I will take thank my you, leave. Thank you. Thank you.